Uh, hello, uh, good evening. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hollyoaks screening in association with Channel 4, the Royal Television Society, and Love Music, Hate Racism. Uh, I'm Brian Kirkwood, the executive producer of Hollyoaks. Um, and at Hollyoaks, we work to a formula that has been created and shaped by talking directly to our audience. Every evening at 6.30 p.m., we give our viewers a bright and colourful universe of heightened escapism, romance and real-world issues. These themes give our audience three ways to engage in the show. The gloriously soapy stories provide a thrilling escape. The love stories provide warm aspiration and heart and our real-world issues that our viewers see themselves reflected back from the TV. And in these tumultuous times, our audience tell us increasingly that they love our serious, heart-hitting issues that they don't get anywhere else. Issue stories matter to our viewers, and they chime with Channel 4's public service remit. So the year-long story, The Radicalisation of Stee, is a bold departure for Hollyoaks and for British Soap, in that it's the first time we've ever gone near religion and politics. The story has taken an unflinching look at how extremists prey on the vulnerable and the disenfranchised in society, and how Britain's communities are under threat from increasingly polarised views. It's not your traditional soap fodder until you scratch the surface and realise that at its heart, it's a story about love versus hate. So tonight, you're going to watch three episodes cut together into an hour-long hour package written by Jay Shree Patel and Kevin Rundle and directed by Aid Bean. After that, we'll have a panel discussion hosted by Nihal Arthanayake and you will meet the team behind the show. So the story so far, Stee Hay has been groomed by far-right extremists Stuart and Johnny and now they're planning an attack on an Islamic community centre. Meanwhile, Stee's best friend Sinead, who's also the mother of his child, has got engaged to Sammy, who's a British Muslim. When these two stories collide, Steve realises just how much trouble he's in. Thank you. What were your <clears throat> worries, your concerns going into? I think from both sides, like just loving the character that I'd, I'd worked hard at for the past 13 years and he was hated when he first came into it because we did a domestic abuse storyline to then working really hard to get the audience on his side to now going completely the other way again where the audience would hate him and you get a bit passionate for your character. Um, so walking around in the streets and people shouting racist and it has happened and I have to come off social media because of it and people was, were basically saying he must be racist in real life otherwise he wouldn't have took this storyline on and then we'd start filming things where I'd have to say horrible things and there was a scene when I had to smash up a motorbike um, and then I was, I was just doing it half arsed really because I didn't want to offend everybody. So I had to delete Twitter because of that. Um, and then from speaking to Exit UK, saying some of these groups can get quite violent. If we were showing them in a bad light, would they, would they come after us? So there was, yeah, from both sides, I was quite nervous. Mm, it's funny to say, Ray plays Johnny, everyone. Ray's <coughs> in the building uh, today. Yeah. Ray um, said earlier on when he was on my five live shows, you were earlier on, that uh, he was in a coffee shop and... And what did, she, what did she say to you, the woman in the coffee uh, shop? Yeah, she, she just come out from the side and said, oh, don't say it, he's a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make it unambiguous here. <laughs> They're playing roles, all right? None of them are racist. <laughs> I don't want to put that out there. Um, Jay Shree, as the writer, as one of the writers, of course, um, what were the biggest challenges for you writing this story? Yeah, so I think it's important to say that was one of the writers. Yeah. Kevin Wundle uh, was the other writer, but Kevin's not here, so all the best bits were mine. Well, let's just say he doesn't exist. Get that, get that straight. Yeah, so it was very, very challenging. I think one of the, one of the things that we always have to be aware of is the, sh is the show airs at 6.30. So to be able to tell a story that is so deep... Um, and involves violence, involves you know a, a terrorist attack. Basically, was really really difficult in order to to make sure that we meet those watershed sort of uh, requirements. So that was very difficult. Um, personally, for me, it was an honour to actually be in, involved in this for two reasons. So for me, the first part um, was I'm not Muslim, but I am Asian, and therefore the experiences that. I can write about in terms of the Malik family 
and they've said I am an honorary Malik now, aren't I? <laughs> um, that, you know, there's a lot of sort of shared experience there. So that helps with, with, with the writing. But equally, uh, for me, and this is one of the things I'd, I'd said to Brian right at the start in terms of wanting to be involved with this story, um, prior to being a scriptwriter, I was a high school teacher. Um, and Stee was basically one of my kids. <coughs> so that white working class boy in the classroom who'd be the first to sort of carry your books for you or take your bags to the lesson or do things for you, open the door for you, desperately polite and everything else, when you sort of see that journey of them going from being this really lovely lad to somebody who's joined a, a, a far-right organisation or even somebody who sympathises with those points of view. So when you sort of see those teenagers that you used to teach then sharing those sorts of memes that Steve was doing, it really sort of resonates with me because what you have here are a group of white young men, disenfranchised, not feeling like they belong to society, feeling like society's turned its back on them and they need status, they need to feel like they belong somewhere, and that's why they end up becoming um, so vulnerable. Rishi, what was it like to be, as Sammy, on the receiving end of that kind of hate? I was talking to Harvey earlier on and just asking about how you channel mm. your own experiences of being on that. Now, hopefully you haven't had that many experiences, mm. but I'm in my 40s, so I remember skinheads and I remember <coughs> what that felt like for them to be on the streets. What about yourself? I mean, it was tough, of course. It's a hard, <clears throat> it's a hard storyline to do. Um, and you can draw on those personal experiences. I mean, growing up as a kid, um, you know, the only times I sort of experienced it was mainly on the football field growing up um, 13, 14. I mean, I was very lucky to grow up in London, which was a very multicultural city. So I think I was lucky in that aspect. But I did suffer racism. And I remember how it made me feel. You know, when, you <clears throat> when you're a victim of racism through people hating you for no fault of you and you haven't done anything, you know, for people hating you just because of the colour of your skin makes you feel a certain way, which you obviously know yourself is, you, it's so hard to describe, it doesn't feel like anything else. Um, and so I could kind of channel that, especially at the beginning stages when um, it all started off with a, a look here, a little comment, you know, and from my experiences, even as I've gone older, if there's, I've got that little look or that little comment, you always kind of, you kind of second guess yourself and you think, God, did that just happen, or did I, am I overthinking it? You know, and, and I think that we could use that, and I could draw on that kind of feeling of how it made me feel, that kind of bubbling, angry, upset. Um, <clears throat> and then as we progressed with the storyline, obviously the racism gets a lot worse, which for me personally, luckily, I never experienced. But what I could draw on is that same kind of underlying feeling behind it. Um, and also just kind of channeling how would Sammy feel uh, being in that position um, and doing the storyline, you know, I've had uh, a lot of people that have messaged me or spoke to me in the street or via social media about their experiences of racism and being a victim of that and some really horrific stories. And, you know, as an actor, kind of channeling their feelings and their thoughts and, and using that to portray it, which can be quite draining and daunting at the same time. But equally, I'm so proud to be part of this storyline and to be part of this story. And so... I was more than happy to put myself through that to tell this story. And how for you as well? I mean, you're the matriarch of the Malik family. And yeah. It's not, you know, you've been through your own painful episodes. So <laughs> yeah. It, 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 a, lot, a lot of what Rich has just said there, and I think also there's a, you know, there is that sense, especially now at 50 something, there's when, if it happens now, there's a, I have a different reaction to it to when it happened when you were like 12, 13, 14 or um, 20 or whatever. Um, and that, in that moment, almost, you don't know what to do. Because there's a bit of you that goes, I can't believe that just happened, yeah. actually, especially when it's really subtle. When somebody's in your face, you can deal with it, even if that means you walk away and then you feel horrible afterwards. But when it's done almost in a way with a smile on your face, that's when it's um, really hard to mm. deal with because you, you do second guess yourself. You think, am I being oversensitive here? Mm. So you can use all of that uh, to, to, to inform the character. And I think, you know, with Mizbah especially, her, with her children, she's always been that, 
you know, we are strong, we are bigger, we are going to be better, we are going to deal with this in a loving kind of mindfulness way. I know that's what they've done, but we can be... But even Mizbah throughout this journey started to waver and then actually lost her way because she herself couldn't hold it together as, as, like, as she could before. And, and, she, and she said, that's it, I'm done, I, they've won. Um, and for her to say that, that was actually a really uh, scary moment in there because if she's feeling lost, then her children are going to be lost because she's not there to hold them together. Now, of course, Hollyoaks is a work of fiction, and other than women who work in coffee shops, most people regard it that it is uh, a work of fiction <laughs> and that a Bray isn't a racist. Um, but, Nick, I mean, as the national coordinator for Prevent Within Counterterrorism, how growing a threat is this? Because we have been bombarded since 9 11 with this idea that extremism is an Islamist issue. How as I say, bigger threat is this rise of far-right extremism. Um, I suppose if I could start uh, by saying wow, I mean, that was an absolutely brilliant episode. Uh, well done to all of you. It was um, uh, emotionally draining to watch it, never mind the energy that you could see in the characters was, uh, was phenomenal. And, we'll um, ask Kieran about that later on. Yeah, I don't know how, how you find so many tears. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what, what an amazing story to tell. Uh, and for, for the, the reason that you're highlighting, that we see, um, I suppose, across our communities, whether it's on the back of uh, Brexit, some of the things that are going on across not just the UK, but the, the, the sort of wider world, that there is, um, seems to feel like, at any rate, there's a, a shift in what people think and find as acceptable values, acceptable norms now. And I think, you know, as a police officer, I've been a police officer for... Uh, 18 years now and I joined the police because I passionately wanted to help people and keep people safe and this is one of those jobs where I go to work every day and feel like I'm trying to keep people safe and so um, taking what at one end of the spectrum is that sort of um, that shifting environment in some of our communities where actually people can start to use hate-filled speech in a way that perhaps they haven't before they felt they feel um, they've got permission to do that right through the really complex range of issues that has been represented in the story that, that potentially at the upper end culminates in, in what we saw. And I get there's, there's definitely some dramatic um, license. Uh, license and poetic license, but, but you know, this is not beyond the realms of fantasy. We've seen this happening within our communities, haven't we, in terms of attacks. And whether or not um, an attack is perpetrated uh, through a uh, Islamist jihadist ideology or through an extreme right wing ideology, the harm, the devastation, the destruction to communities, to families, um, is the same. Going back to the question that you actually asked me, what we see within our work within counter terrorism policing is that at the moment about 25% of all of our investigations each year are right wing, so far an extreme right wing, um, and the other 75% will be. Um, generally uh, Islamist related but within that we will also have kind of animal rights related plots as well and far left issues uh, and, uh, and other sectarian issues. Is that changing though? If, if I'd asked you five years ago the same question would that number have been less? Yes, well. yes it would have been less. So it's, um, it, it has grown. The, the proportion then of referrals that we get into the PREVENT programme have grown at a similar uh, at a similar rate, um, about one in five prevent referrals at the moment would be right-wing related. Um, and I think that represents um, the awareness raising. You know, things like this will do an absolutely fantastic job. You cannot underestimate the impact this will have on raising people's awareness of the issues, the vulnerabilities that exist, how people are potentially radicalised. Because for, for us, what we want is for people to spot those signs at a really early stage before things escalate to what we've seen tonight. We want, we want people to come forward and say, I'm really worried about Steve. This is what he's starting to do. What, what help can I get? Because there is help out there. And whether that's through the sorts of programmes that um, uh, have been working with the programme to, to look at the, the sorts of interventions that would be put in place um, and how we would help people to, to rationalise. And there's been a whole range of different ways you've done that tonight, sort of showing how you rationalise all of the different... Uh, extremist language and rhetoric that's that's 
that's put out there and how it, the impact it has on somebody and getting somebody to understand that and the impact it's had on them and finding ways of, of kind of giving people that opportunity to, um, to be diverted from that, that path is, is really, really important. But the earlier you start down that, that route... You can spot it online easier. as well, can't Push you? Coming. You can see things. We started quite a lot of ours with like memes and things like that. But I've noticed and so when people comment, you can spot signs of it online basically well that's you... what i mean brian and i you were we were having a conversation before yeah. this began and you were giving me a very specific example about going onto a certain message board and then just tell us more about that because i thought that was fascinating yeah. and terrifying and well again as kieran said a lot of what was on screen tonight goes back to our very first um, interaction with nigel from small steps who's here in the audience uh, in the exit uk who's worked with us from the start and advising us on how someone like Steve would be groomed into actions that we saw tonight. Um, and something that you told me that's stuck with me is that, um, is that people think that far right or any kind of extremism is happening in kind of in church halls or uh, in uh, scout huts where they're all kind of frothing at the mouth, but actually it's happening online and it's happening in the comment section. Uh, and I'm going to misrepresent what you said, but I'll try and stay on the track. But about um, people like Steve, we talk about them being a foot soldier and they're sitting there looking at the comment section of something as innocent like a, a, how do I, a wallpaper for my children's nursery, sitting there waiting for the comments, watching the comments come up, and they'll chuck a hand grenade in about that nursery being around the corner from a mosque and then see light the touch paper, sit back, and then, and then, well, you, do you want to just help me out there? No, Please, no, Nigel. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's just a simple thing. They will sit there and basically what they will do is just look for anything they can use, whether it's the closing of a library through to uh, cutting, you know, local services. It can be absolutely anything. But all they'll do is just bring you round so it can alter it to their point of view. And, you know, if they've got somebody who can come victim, if somebody that can walk in there and become somebody who can actually be seen as a hero, and we've got the answers, you know, if we ban uh, OCs, I, we've got more money for our own, a simple one liner like that can just start a really, really difficult conversation. I think, I suppose it comes back to, in the internet in particular, it comes back to, you know, that we're all connected on the internet, we're all out there, we're all logging onto things, viewing things, and, um, and there will be um, in every family across the country, somebody who is vulnerable because of things that have happened to them in their lives, um, you know, people who feel that they haven't achieved as much as they should or could have achieved, people that have got a need for, for belonging, um, I'm sure there's all sorts of things that have happened in Steve's life that have, that have taken to that point. They're out there, as you said, they're fishing in that pool to find somebody that has a vulnerability and once they latch onto it and they expose it and they explore it, it's then easy to start exploiting that person and reeling them in and, and the, the the challenge that we all have in balancing free speech and, and the kind of openness of, of the internet um, is that for people who are vulnerable, um, they are potentially ripe pickings for extremists, either directly or because of the sorts of propaganda that is absolutely awash now on the internet, um, that it in itself has that radicalising effect on people and, and signposts them to where they might then go. I guess in a macro sense then, how do we win? Because an organisation such as the police and prevent within that, you have to have resources to do it. There are, I think we did on my radio show the other day, we, we through beeps, we tried to tell our audience and illustrate how much is being uploaded onto the internet at any one time, on YouTube, on Twitter, and it is unbelievable. Just for Twitter, it was a continuous beep. It wasn't just beep, beep, it just went, yeah, it's so much information. How do you... Crack will be here for three days to try and answer that question. Right. Um, so you, know, you have to do it with all of our helps, right? Yeah, so absolutely. So, so uh, you know, on the one level, um, what we've got to be as communities is resilient to that sort of information in the first place. And the sorts of uh, projects that um, Nigel works on works with community groups to build up that sort of resilience. I think one of the... Um, I was doing my diligent uh, cop bit while I was sat there, and one of the, um, the billboards in the episode talked about the rising hate crime reports in Hollyoaks. So it's, it's that sort of stuff that signposts us as professionals um, to communities and areas within our society where there are problems, because we're already seeing it with hate crime spiking um, reports coming in. 
that's the sort of place where it's starting point. As communities, we need to come together, and then society, the state, needs to invest money, support charities, enable projects to work in those areas to build up that resilience. That's you know that's one area. We've also got to do work globally with the big um, internet giants to make sure that as fast as their algorithms upload information, they're also stripping it off, so that we make it harder and harder for extremist material to go online. Um, technology is, is advancing at such a fast rate, and whilst on the one hand, that means it's going to make it easier for extremists to put all sorts of stuff out there. Um, the, the artificial intelligence technology is also getting better at removing it. So, you know, that's the next thing. Then the big thing for me is when you have, a, have someone like Steve who, who has been radicalised and there's people in his life who are seeing that and are worried about it, that was evident from the episodes, we've then got to have the confidence to come forward, trust people like me, trust people like Nigel, who will then come identify those vulnerabilities, work out a programme that's going to support that individual, taking account of their needs to help them get back onto the right path. But Sinead, for instance, as a character there, might not want to criminalise the father of her child. I mean, she might not want to do that. And as soon as you hear prevent and counter-terrorism, that's entering state into the criminal justice system. And we saw that with um, Muslim families as well, with prevent, saying, well, we don't want to criminalise our kids. We want them to be on the right path. How do you so I think, get that right? Yeah, so it's a really difficult one. Um, the, the starting point is coming in to prevent is not a criminal sanction. There is no criminalising that goes on. What I appreciate, though, is there's a real fear that people have. Um, there's a stigma that's attached to having been involved in a programme that is in some way linked to counter-terrorism. Uh, and, that, and that's a challenge for all professionals working in prevent. Part of... I think what we've got to do as a community is recognise the very serious risk that we've seen on the screen tonight of radicalisation um, and that we've got to be bold in coming forward and intervening at an early stage. The earlier the opportunity to intervene exists, the, the, there is no criminalisation. Somebody will come into the programme, they get support through the programme and what we want is somebody to exit at the other end with a kind of positive outcome, which means there's no formal criminal records, there's no criminal sanctions. It, it, if anything... Um, what it helps people to do is to get their lives back on track, get college places, get university places. It makes a real positive difference to people's lives. We've got to get the message out there that that's what, what prevents about. Um, right. Nick used the word bold there. It's very bold of Hollyoaks and, and Channel 4 to give this amount of time. I mean, Steve, your journey began really when your sister died <coughs> just over a year ago. Um, so, in October, sorry, 2018. January of this year is when it begins. Um, that takes a lot of faith from a channel and from an exec producer to give it that space, to give Jay Shree and another writer time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's the, the gift of, of soap, really, that you can tell stories over, over years and you have to have the right judgment as to how, how long is too long. Um, We've just told a 20-year story about male rape with Gary Lucy's character, um, Luke Morgan. Um, and again, going back to Nigel's initial advice, um, I remember you saying that the, 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 the grooming of someone like Steve might take longer, would probably take something like three years. Obviously, we don't want to tell that over three years, so we have to kind don't of make... I think Kieran wants it over three years. <laughs> People don't want to watch it over three years, yeah. you know, and that's that point about, you know, taking it seriously, but making a judgment about how long is too long. So we think we've got it right. We cannot, we couldn't fast forward the grooming process because it becomes implausible and people disengage if it's implausible. Um, so that's, and I not think, a year is the right time. I mean, that's... The problem with a lot of movies, for instance, you see, it becomes cartoony. I mean, Jay Shree, what surprised you more? I mean, speaking to people like Nigel, what were the things that kind of terrified you and surprised you most about researching this in order to write? Um, I think one of the things that really uh, struck me more than anything else when I was doing bits of research and trying to uh, look at what the sort of work that Small Steps do and Exit UK do. It was actually reading uh, the case studies of people who had become involved um, in these uh, right-wing groups and why they did, but also the stories of them wanting to leave and wanting to escape um, and feeling like they couldn't. You see how conflicted state. Yeah, absolutely. So 
in a sense, one of the things that's really, really difficult is even though they believe that these far-right beliefs are wrong and they're not for them and they want to leave these groups, they can't, A, because of uh, the potential threat, so they're often threatened with violence um, or, their, or their family will, will have to face violence if, if they leave, but also there's that um, sense of camaraderie that they miss. So even if their beliefs aren't far-right anymore, the fact that they have got this group of friends... Um, a group of peers who sort of understand them makes it very, very difficult for them um, to leave. And also the fact that their own families and friends might have ostracised them, so therefore they're standing alone. Um, and also how, how far many of these uh, young men have to escape to in order to sort of uh, escape the far right. They change location, um, cut all ties with people, cut off social media. I think that aspect of it was, was very difficult um, to read about and to learn. That, that surprised me, that, that story and just, just, just on that Just on that point, what we will often see in cases is a real conflicted uh, set of circumstances for people in terms of their ideology. So they may start off um, looking to join a, a jihadist group, an Islamist group, and end up with a far-right or extreme-right group. I'm not suggesting that as a storyline, by the way. <laughs> uh, switch, but, that, but, that, but that kind of... The, it's, it's that reality of what people are seeking, what they need in their lives. And unless the solutions to that provides an alternative, then it's really difficult to get people to exit from that. Even if, as, as Steve has, this, this real repulsion, you can see it for the ideology and, and where the, the actual ideology is taking him. But you're then trapped in, in that environment where it's given you everything... And how do you how do you replace that? Um, you know, and that is sometimes it's employment, it's it's new social circles, it's a sense of belonging to something else, it's a sense of achievement. Yeah, they gave him all that, and they were buying his kids toys and yeah. giving him somewhere Classic to live. Room. Yeah. So if we, you know, if we as a society then, uh, and as agencies and charities working in this space with with people like Steve, if we can't offer an alternative to that, then we we're, we're not going to succeed in diverting somebody away from that. Uh, Rishi, what feedback have you had across your social media or indeed people in the street from what? I think when it first started, I think a lot of people found it really difficult to watch. That was the initial reaction we got. I mean, when that we had that first special episode that aired, um, <clears throat> I tried to stay off Twitter and not read anything. But when this storyline came, I was really intrigued. So I went on and seen it and a lot of people were saying, Hollywood shouldn't be doing this. It's so difficult to watch. And... Essentially, that's what we wanted. We wanted it to be a hard watch because racism is hard. You know, it's never we, you can never paint that in a, in a good light. And <laughs> essentially, I mean, that's we wanted people to feel uncomfortable watching it because if you do see racism in the street, it is really uncomfortable. As the storylines progressed, um, I think I've got a lot of feedback from people that are, like I said earlier, victims of racism who feel like their story is being represented. They're they're a voice that can be heard now. Um, you know, I had messages from a teacher saying that they've added some of these Hollyoaks to their curriculum in their school to help uh, teach about racism, engages the students more. So when you hear something like that, I mean, you know, as an actor doing something you love and making a difference like that is the, is, is the biggest joy that you could really have. And I think it's been a really positive feedback a year on now from that story, and I think it's made a real difference. Mm. In fact, Steve... Um, Steve, so Kieran... Uh, <laughs> Am I that believable? <laughs> you were so, it's quite interesting, you were saying when uh, two sets of people came up. Oh yeah, so I'd been, I'd been shopping in the Trafford Centre, which is not too far from here, and I was with my husband, just bobbing about, and it must have been about ten pictures in a row with people from the Muslim community being like, thank you so much, Hollywood's being our voice. Amazing, that hasn't happened before. And then after like the 10th one, these two kids came over, must have been about 11 or 12 year old, having a picture, and they were like, we loved it last night when you said to them Muslims, get out of our country. And I was like, wow, these kids aren't thinking that. They've obviously watched it with their parents or something. So that's why it's so important to tell a story. To that demographic as well, to young kids, they shouldn't be thinking that at that age. So yeah, what that's... What you say the, to them? Nothing, there's no response you can say. I was just open-mouthed, and yeah. I'd say that's been... The weirdest thing about it all is that that particular moment of being like a punch in the gut, really thinking, I can't, it genuinely does happen, and this is what kids are thinking. It's not. But going back to our first conversation, what is brilliant, the positive of that reaction is that's the opposite of what yeah. you were dreading. 
who were really fearful about getting a, a negative response from the Muslim viewers, uh, and actually it's been it's been nothing really but received. positive, yeah. As you said, for giving a voice to a story they haven't seen elsewhere. Mm. Harvey, what reactions do you have? Really positive, actually. Um, the ones that the one that really sticks with me, though, are, and I know I told you earlier, were these two two. Uh, Muslim girls in in, in a sari shop uh, <laughs> who came over and said, oh, yeah, yeah, and said, oh well, uh, we want you to stop doing it now because it's really hard to watch. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So we had a great conversation because I asked them, why why do they think we should stop? Because it's a hard subject. And I said, surely, uh, uh, have you been through it? They were like, well, yeah, we've all been through it. We're you know. Yeah. I was like, but this is why we need to talk about it then because. How can we change it if we don't talk about it? Mm. If you've experienced all this and you guys only talk about it amongst yourselves, how will it ever change? And yes, it's uncomfortable and difficult to watch, but it should be because it is uncomfortable and difficult and wrong. Um, so we had a great conversation. And that, the, uh, I've had so many people, and they range from young people to grannies, uh, you know, Marks and Spencers, who come up and say, Oh, it's really tough watching that at the moment. It's really hard. Um, I think the one show is great for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that wonderful to have that range of people, to have like young people and old people all talking about the same subject mm. and bringing their perspective to it? And to actually, you know, most people are really lovely and generous and kind. So it, most people. I guess maybe people who are racist weren't going to come up and talk to me anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's okay. Say, but, um, look, Nick pointed out with the numbers that it is a problem, that it's rising. But I want to get a sense of a feeling. Rishi, do you get a feeling that people are becoming more involved to say the kind of things that when growing up, perhaps you, you didn't hear that much of? I think... I don't think people have changed their views. I think people probably now feel like there's more of a platform to, to go there and, and say it more openly. Um, you know, I don't want to get into politics or anything, but because of the political climate and things that we've seen, whether it be in America or Great Britain, I think people who would normally have those views but keep quiet feel like now they can be a bit more outspoken about it. And of course we're a democracy and everyone is entitled to their opinion. And I think that's why it feels like, to me personally, there is this kind of uprising off that right wing, off that racism that we see. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily more people thinking like that. And I think, to be honest, it probably does have a knock-on effect because you hear more people talking about it and it probably does influence other people. And so that's probably one of the reasons why numbers are rising, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, I think, personally, in my everyday life, I don't really see it, but through what we all see, the news and the media and everything, we can all probably agree, I agree. that there's... I, I, I used to think that naively now, I know, that, um, you know, when I was older, mm -hmm. it would have checked this, uh, but it's not, it's, 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 it. so I've been asking myself this question for a good few years now, is it that, so yeah, maybe it just never went away, but people learn not to say what they really thought, mm. and that's what saddens me, really, and it's like, oh my God, okay, it's not that you, no, all oh, right, you always thought it, but you just never said it. And now, maybe, because of where we are, you're hearing it in America, you're hearing it in Europe, you're hearing it in the world, that uh, people feel that actually you are, they can turn around and say what they want to say. Mm. And if you don't like it, well, that's my opinion. Well, you like, that's your opinion, that's okay. But, yeah. Mm. See, I, I agree. Mm. I um a slightly different perspective in, in that sense. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s where, you know, at school there was quite, quite a bit of racism, you know, all good sports. So yeah, yeah. that was quite fun. But then as a young adult in the 90s, now, you know, the 90s I think has become the new 60s in the sense of weren't the 90s brilliant, everybody loved each other and mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And I genuinely believe that it wasn't just a case of people not saying people were always racist and they just kept quiet. I actually believe that there was a change in terms of the way people generally felt. So, for example, when you saw, see the pictures of the London Olympics, 
that was real. That wasn't pretend. People weren't faking that. That actually was there, of, of um, a reclaiming of the Union Jack, a reclaiming of what Britishness actually meant. Mm -hmm. And again, without becoming too political, I think it is very much linked to the economy. And when you see an economic down, downturn, like you did in the 70s, and like you have now, what happens is people find an identifiable minority to blame for the problems that society has. So I genuinely think that during that time, I didn't imagine this lovely, flower-filled time in the 90s. It, it was real. Um, I want to open it up to you guys now. If you have any questions for our guests, our esteemed guests, then uh, raise a hand, and uh, we will put the question to them. Yeah, my name's Leslie Price. Um, I've worked with hundreds of Steves. I've been in County Terrorism 15 years, and begin to prevent seven. Um, all I'd like, just a couple of comments, really. The comment about the families and are they criminalising, they come to us and say thank you. <laughs> They're really grateful for the work that we do. So that's an important key message, because we are safeguarding. <laughs> and that's something that um, you know, I'm really proud of, because I've been doing it a long time. So, <laughs> um, And I thought what the comment we just had then was really good. Um, changing societies really. I think more people are reporting it now. I don't think there's more of it. <laughs> I think people are more aware that therefore we are getting more reports and people do those. So but yeah, to the actors, very good. For the people I know who have done the uh, the grooming, spot on. Um can I enjoy it, so thank you. I think where you move that, one of the most uh, heartwarming stories I heard, and it was on the back of an officer who'd worked with somebody who'd um, been expelled from their college for all sorts of stuff they posted online, posters and stickers they put up around the college. And the officer worked with them and then took them to five different colleges before they could convince somebody to give them a place in a college and get them back into college at the end of a prevent case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the lengths that, that people go to. And it's that, you know, it's that sense of it's not prevent that criminalises you, it's all the stuff that you've put out on the internet that's there, attached to your name forever, and to find somebody to give you a second chance. And that's why I'm so proud of officers that dedicate so much time and, and effort to to make it a difference for people who, you know, ultimately get a second chance. And that's, that's the only way long-term society is going to be better, isn't it, if we, yeah. if we you know, help people to realise that this is, a, is the wrong path. I think, just, just very quickly before I ask that question, it's getting that balance right between sympathy, or indeed empathy, for what Steer has gone through. Because it's quite easy to dismiss and just go racist. Right? And then that's the end of the conversation. So that, I think, Jason and Brian, is a quite an interesting balance in act to yeah. get to, into the nuance of it. It is, and at this point I've got to thank Liz Page and Emma Beaumont from the Channel 4 compliance team, who... Um, compliance <laughs> teams don't get enough of a shout. They don't. Compliance teams, young heroes, and everything. Thank you. At the BBC, we did like... like they a had a coronary <laughs> when we said we wanted to do a story about far-right extremism. <laughs> Um, it is the most difficult story that you've that they've ever had to kind of negotiate and navigate with us, and it's all about balance. You know, we we want to stay on the telly, and there've been times when we've got a bit giddy about going in a direction and we've been pulled back. Um, and I think it's all about balance. And again, as you say, about empathising and not demonising Steve, who is, you know, made some terrible choices mm. but is a victim in this as well mm. so there's no sort of attempt at justifying what no. steve's mm. done um and i think we've oh, we've kind of made it really really yeah. clear but what we have done hopefully is to create an understanding for why people might make poor decisions mm. Mm. it's a very simplistic view of the world that says understanding something is justifying something <laughs> and unfortunately we do live in those <laughs> times sometimes um please sir yeah, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Alex, I'm about to start a media psychology degree, uh, oh. master's here, even. Um, so I'm kind of interested in how you'd evaluate a storyline like this, whether it's something you'd do uh, at Lyme individually or uh, in collaboration with Four, how that would sort of work and how it would maybe inform kind of future storylines. So what's the collaborative process, is it? Uh, more about the evaluation. The evaluation. The evaluation. Yeah. I'll give them a Well, um... Brilliantly, we have a, a really strong relationship between Hollyoaks, Lime Pictures and Channel 4. Uh, Rebecca Holdsworth is our commissioner who's here tonight. And we also have um, regular meetings with the audience research team every, uh, every few months where they give us feedback, um, bad, good and indifferent, on how stories, characters, themes are going 
uh, of being um, engaging with the audience. And brilliantly and pleasingly, the audience have told us that they are really engaged with this story, that um, their identification with um, Steve's position, that not, not Steve's choices, is something that they understand. And what I love about that feedback is it proves how clever our audience are um, and how they must never be dismissed as, um, as a tea time soap audience. There are so much more than that. Question. One last question. Yes. Um, just following. So, hi, I'm Vicky from Small Steps slash Exit UK. Um, it was more to say thank you, and not from the back of that evaluating, we've had so many people contact us through Exit UK. So basically, it's former members of far right groups that support people that want to leave. So if they don't want to go to prevent necessarily because of the implications that we talked about earlier, or you guys talked about earlier, they can contact us for support. We had a 16-year-old contact us on Sunday. He'd been watching Hollyoaks, and I want out, you know, wow. and that's just one. Of that's a self-referral, not about someone else. That's no, it, it's himself. all self-referrals. Or right. occasionally we have parents as well, or brothers or sisters. But just to say, I'm not normally on the mic, I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, You're doing a good job. But I just wanted to say that, that from that question, really, for us, the evaluation, amazing work, because we've had, you know, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a big company, and we really try hard through all of their work, all of the former members of the groups, just to kind of say, we did something, we recognise it, we want to help people, we don't want people to go through what you've gone through. We've got parents who empathise, we've been there, don't feel stupid, don't feel embarrassed, we've been there, take your time, we'll listen to you, we'll support you. Does so it, I just it, wanted to let you know that. <laughs> does it take an equal amount of time to, to kind of, I guess, uh, to absolve people of the hate that exists within them? A long time, and it varies, and it's different situations, every person's got a completely different escapism, a different, yeah, I mean, it could be something that they've seen, something that they've done, something that they've heard, you know, whether they've lost their family, their friends, their jobs, a criminal record, all sorts of reasons. And it, is, it can be a very quick process, or sometimes it can be much longer. We've had somebody on the, on the books for about two years now, and we're still talking to him from time to time. Um, does it go, just lastly, because we're running out of time, but Nick, does this go a, across age and and class especially, I think one of the stereotypes, especially, I mean, look, Tommy Robinson chose this part of the world, you know, maybe not coincidentally, I don't know, but he chose this part of the world to try and run as an MEP. Luckily, he got, I think, 3% of the vote, lost his deposit, and the people in North West told him to <laughs> off. But, <laughs> largely, uh, you can tell I'm not on radio now. So, so, um, but does it go across class, age, background? Uh, to an extent, I think what I mean what we've talked about right throughout the course of the evening is the sorts of things that, um, that that draw people into needing to be to belong to something. And young people, when they're in the formative years, and from their sort of early mid teens up into their mid twenties, when lots of people they settle down, they have kids, there are the things that happen in, in people's lives that give them that stability. Um, we see it across all types of crime as well. People get involved in crime in 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 those years. So. Um, you know, sorts of demographic issues that we've been talking about tonight are absolutely relevant uh, to the sorts of challenges that we that we face. Mm. So it's why the, the, you, it's not easy to stereotype. No, it isn't. And, and every single um, individual story that leads them to wanting to be part of an extremist group is unique to them. Um, you know, we've we've seen it play out really powerfully in the in the story in the way in which an individual circumstances is manipulated and and used uh, to to lure them in. So, um, you know, the. the there is no single pathway into becoming an extremist. There is no single stereotype of extremist. We, we, you know, we're really clear that what we do needs to be really diverse. Why, why we, you know, coming up to the, um, the comments from um, the lady there from Small Steps. You know, the, the importance of people being able to go to um, organisations that can help them leave that that world. Uh, is a really important one, and and small steps are an organisation that um, are approved by the Home Office to do this sort of work. So, because one of the things that's really important in this is that sometimes when people are facing the sort of dilemmas that Steve had, 
they will go to people they trust in their life. It might be a family member, it might be a former teacher, it might be somebody who used to work at a youth project, and they'll, and they'll talk to them first. Um, when, you know, if that's you, when that person comes to you, it's really important that you also help them to seek help from professionals that work in this space. Because the one thing that the police have access to um, is all the sorts of wider information about the other people that Steve's connected to that might say, hold on a second, Steve's at risk here, but not only that, we think this is part of a much bigger plot. And whilst we might want to offer Steve some intervention to get him away from that, this is the final piece in the jigsaw puzzle about these other individuals who we now need to do that raid and, and arrest people in order to protect the public. So it's really important that people don't sit and let information build over months and months and months because when they do come forward, then it either might be too late to intervene in that early intervention space and Steve might end up being criminalised, um, or it might be too late because something terrible happens and, and members of the public and the family get hurt. So the people that get involved in this sort of stuff that will get arrested and prosecuted and will go to prison and it's that second chance that they get at the other end. There may be some, some sanction and punishment that needs to come with um, what people are involved in but then we give people a second chance to it's what we it's what one of the things that's great about our society um brilliant well look i know there's a number of cast members here if you can put your hands up I'd like to you know, raise it come on don't be shy put your hands up if you're a cast member of, come on bro come on you <laughs> right round of applause for everybody Prevent is the, um, the bit of uh, counter-terrorism policing we have that looks at stopping people from either being um, engaged really early in, in terrorism, supporting terrorism, and that's everything from getting involved in fundraising or downloading terrorist material, or indeed right up to getting drawn into getting involved in a terrorist attack. Personally, I think it's like such a relevant issue to talk about, therefore it's like... It's an amazing platform to put it on as well at like Hollyoaks, that's what it is, like discussing such you know, truthful and relevant storylines. I don't think a lot of people knew about the far right and how uh, they seem to have grown um, uh, and the impact it has been having on young people, especially people who feel that they're alone or they've been left behind or, or feel ostracised or something. And to be able to highlight that within Hollyoaks and within our storyline and, and to let people, make people aware of that, it's just, um, it's just really an honour to be able to do tough storylines like that with, with Holly Oaks. Oh, very proud of yeah. it, yeah. Very, very proud of it. Yeah, because we've got, we were just saying, we were just chatting off camera about how challenging it, it, it is, the fact that it's uh, very pre-watershed. Uh, you know, so there's certain things you can say and you can't say, but you've got to try and make it as hard hitting as possible. So what I'd like more than anything else to come out of the storyline is for people to think about um, how they might have been manipulated by the so by social media in particular, um, in terms of things that they've read and they've shared without fact, uh, fact checking. Uh, the other thing is obviously people referring themselves to small steps, which is a huge thing for us. I think the outcome of the story is really is, is making sure that society understands that you know forgiveness is paramount to getting people out of the far right. We care about people. We want to intervene. We want to divert people away from radicalisation. And if we get information about concerns at an early enough stage, we can do that. We can give people an opportunity to put their lives back on track. You can be groomed without realising you're being groomed. I think that's the message and it's like, you know, see the signs. Yeah. And I think if it, with, with any situation, whatever negative situation you find yourself in or hard times and, you, and you're worried about things, before any of that happens, open your mouth and talk about it. You can't be scared to speak to people, whether it be a member of your, of your family someone that you know, a friend, and you know what, sometimes it could even be a stranger. Nothing tells a story quite like a soap, where people really feel the characters, they know their lives intimately, they understand what's happened to them in the past and why they've been drawn into something. And for me, it just, it just sells it in a really, really powerful way, and I think um, it's that sort of approach that I hope will enable us to, to reach young people in a different way.